Um, we're going to talk about civil resistance, and that is going to involve a long discussion about the law. And I just want to make sure that when we're thinking about the law, that we're connecting it on a larger uh, picture that includes what we just heard um, uh, from the, the uh, Kathy and Bruce and David. Um, Basically, what we're doing as humans is trying to figure out how to live together on this little planet. And uh, we've tried lots of different ways. One way that a lot of us feel is the best approach is for everyone to have an equal say in making agreements. And those agreements then apply impartially, equally, to all of us. And another way of saying that's it, in the democratically derived impartial rule of law. And so that, in a sense, I think is what we're talking about when we talk about law. And in a, another way of looking at it, it, we're really trying to make real the golden rule. That, to me, is the largest, a, a larger purpose of what we're doing here. It's, this isn't some intellectual exercise about the law this way and that way. We're really talking about how to treat each other as human beings. We're creating the human race, an, an equality among people here. And that comes up over and over again. We all know that empire is based on differential treatment of people, racism, classism, et cetera. So those are the, when we talk about law, it's, it's a deep and very heartfelt uh, uh, content and it, it involves all of our human lives together. And um, Kathy Kelly mentioned that part of our urgency on this work is the, the stuff that we face with climate change as human beings. It's not going to just affect certain people. I mean, it's going to affect, it's going to affect all of us. And one of the things that I keep bringing up, will we'll keep bringing up is the importance of uh, enacting the laws against war, which David has talked so much about. Um, that, basically the UN Charter is the, is the biggest, is, is the first, David might quibble about this with the Kellogg-Briand Pact, but it's the first sort of major historical agreement among human beings. It basically created the human race. The, that agreement, the UN Charter. And the reason that we've, we've, we are going to, we're, we're trying to enact that is to end war of aggression, but it's also to build our confidence as humans and our experience at being able to make agreements with each other. And that's, I think, is the only way we're going to deal with the, the larger challenges that the next generation is going to face. We need to be able to make and honor agreements with each other. And so that's part of this discussion, it's, we're going to be talking about the nitty gritty of going to court maybe in DeWitt or in California or wherever, but let's keep in mind that what we're really talking about is the creation and survival of human beings on the planet. And, um, you know, it ties in with what, what David was saying, that all war is murder. We're going to be focusing, or at least I will, on war of aggression, <coughs> which is one nation attacking another nation, which, and this comes down to the civil resistance thing, it's, it's already illegal. It's completely and clearly against U.S. and international law. There's just no doubt about that. And uh, there are other kinds of war that we also need to stop. And all war is murder, um, as we've heard. and. Um, but our actions in the drone base in Syracuse and, and uh, trying to uh, stop the military, the, the U.S. empire, are really trying to bring into reality among us humans this, uh, this agreement that we've already made. And it's already there. And again, uh, I, I was saying to Ellen, I sometimes feel like we in the United States are sort of like Selma, Alabama, that were uh, in, the, in, the, in the 50s or something. The rest of the world recognizes these principles by and large. 
that it's, it's not okay to attack another nation. And we're sitting in this little uh, nation here and saying, well, we're allowed to do it. You know, we're, American supremacy is okay. But the rest of the world knows it's not. And so I, I, I take hope from that um, when we're also talking about our actions in order to enact and, and bring into uh, reality this uh, agreement. I use the word agreement instead of law because it, it, it feels, um, it, it brings it closer to what we're really talking about. Um, agreement among nations not to attack other nations. So that's start. <coughs> yep. So, um, you know, the first time I ever heard the term civil resistance um, was uh, during one of the Plowshares, act uh, Plowshares trials, and I'm trying to remember what year that was, um, but it was from the, the lawyer uh, Francis Boyle, uh, who's out of the uh, University of Illinois, is it? Yes. Yeah. And, yep. and, um, and Francis uh, wrote this book, and he's written uh, several books, and they're, it's really a great book to read if you're, um, just to understand um, sort of from a legal standpoint, uh, or as John would say, an agreement standpoint, <laughs> what, um, what it is we're talking about uh, uh, on, on the legal level. And we, um, so this idea that civil resistance, and Francis is really clear that civil resistance is not civil disobedience, that civil resistance is trying to uphold law, uh, laws that exist already, and um, that you're not, uh, and that that is, that is the point that you that you bring when you go to court. When you um, so when we do these actions, and I'll just use our actions at Hancock as an example be, because it can be used in other uh, places, of course. But um, um, that the hand, that it is our understanding that Article Six, uh, Paragraph Two of the Constitution um, has. Uh, says that um, every treaty that is signed becomes the supreme law of the land and um, and that all judges are to uphold it and um, and so then so that understanding that we also understand that there are these laws or these agreements but uh, that the United States has signed they have become um, it, the, the UN Charter we signed in 19 45, December of 1945, and it was ratified in the Senate 89 to 2, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so the UN Charter says that uh, wars of aggression are illegal. Um, it says that, that uh, violation of due process are, is illegal. It says that um, um, the killing of civ innocent civilians is illegal. It says that um, violation of national sovereignty is illegal. And so our contention is that the use of the drones from Hancock Airfield um, is a violation of all of those laws that are already there. And, um, and by our going to Hancock Airfield, um, getting in the way, trying to <coughs> stop the operations of what, what's happening there, that that is indeed trying to uh, call our, uh, our country in, or our government into accountability and um, to try to, uh, what am I trying to say, to, uh, to, call, to call out the criminality of what's happening from that base um, and that our action is there to uphold those, the law and not to, not to be breaking the law. Um, and to, so um, <coughs> that has been what we've done when we've gone there. We've also brought with us this uh, war crimes indictment, which I actually have copies of, and whoever made these copies, God bless them, but they're really tiny print. But um, I have copies of them, and I'd like to pass them out if anybody wants a copy of it. And um, um, in the war crimes indictment, it um, talks about, um, Article 6 of the Constitution and the UN Charter 
and it also talks about the responsibility that especially law enforcement and the military, uh, the, the, uh, the, the oath that they take to uphold the Constitution. And we had an interesting um, time in one of our court cases where we asked one of the young soldiers uh, who was in the security, who was part of the security and he, um, of the base, and he's, we asked him if he uh, took this oath, and yes, he took an oath to uphold the Constitution, and um, did he know about the First Amendment, and um, he didn't actually really knew it, know it. And he, God knows, if you ask me to quote some of the Constitution, I couldn't tell you. There's, there's certainly other things that I don't know about. Um, so it wasn't to uh, shame him, but it was to point out that we ask people to take these oaths to defend the Constitution, you know, and, and that's what he said. Well, I, I swear to defend the Constitution, but he doesn't know what's in it. And I think Article 6 of the Constitution is a pretty um, major one, actually, that most of us do not know about. And as John likes to point out, he said it's what makes, no, how did you say it? That it makes the, the United States a United States, that, that clause, the supremacy clause, um, says that it doesn't matter what the law in your state says, if these, uh, these, the, there are supreme laws in this land, and that's what makes us a, a United States. And um, so anyway, but this young man not in, didn't know what the first co uh, amendment to the Constitution is, but he also didn't know Article Six of the Constitution, and that most of us don't, and that it's our, it's important for us to learn what it is that we are. Um, these laws that that uh, uh, we're supposed to be upholding, and um, but anyway, in this constitution, I mean, in this indictment, we have um, uh, brought uh, this information to the the um, the soldiers and to the um, base commander. And in it, then we also charge them of uh, the, the different parts of uh, the crimes that are committed there from the base. And um, the ending, I really like the ending of our, of our thing. Um, As citizens of, the nation, of this nation, which maintains over 700 military bases around the globe and the largest, most deadly military arsenal in the world, we believe these words of Martin Luther King still hold true. The greatest purveyor of violence in the world today is our own government. There is hope for a better world when we, the people, hold our government accountable to the laws and treaties that govern this, the use of lethal force and war. To the extent that we ignore our laws and constitution and allow for the unchecked use of lethal force by our government, allowing the government to kill whoever it wants, wherever it wants, whoever it wants, with no accountability, we make the world less safe for children everywhere. We appeal to all United States citizens, military and civilian, and to all public officials to do as required in the Nuremberg Principles and by conscience to refuse to participate in these crimes, to denounce them, and to resist them nonviolently. Um, so uh, one thing that I want to say is, as we have brought um, these issues to court and talked about it. In one of the trials, um, attorney, former ten, Attorney General Ramsey Clark came and testified and talked about Nuremberg and talked to the judge and had a, this whole dialogue with the judge, which was really fascinating to watch. Um, and uh, anyway, what happened is the judge found us guilty, surprisingly, <laughs> um, and he. Um, but at the end, at sentencing, um, we challenged, was it at sentencing or when he found us guilty? But anyway, it, um, the most frustrating part of it was because he wrote this long um, response to us. He was very thoughtful about it. But he totally negated this whole question about, um, about Article 6 of the Constitution and the UN Charter. That becomes a, that is a we have signed that law. It's a uh, it's a binding. I mean, it should be binding, <laughs> and obviously we haven't been following it for a very long time. But anyway, the judge said. Um, so I, I challenged him on it, and he said, well, "Well, what do you want me to do? 
He goes, do you want me to tell the president what to do? And, um, and I said, you know, I, I think that, uh, yes, I actually do want you to do it. I want you to find us not guilty because we are upholding the law, and I want you to uphold the law because the law says in the Constitution, Article 6, that you, as a judge, have a responsibility to, to uphold this. And, um, and then he gave me 15 days. But anyway, that's because I asked for it. <laughs> anyway, so, I, and then, do you want to? Uh, I just want to add one thing, which is on the civil resistance and the whole civil disobedience question. A lot of people, especially of my generation, will look back on the 60s, the civil rights movement, and say, that was civil disobedience. And it's even, even Francis Boyle uses that, makes that distinction. Uh, whereas interna upholding international law, the way that Ellen was talking about, is more civil resistance. Well, in fact, what Martin Luther King and the thousands of other people, it's very important to recognize what a mass movement that was, that was civil resistance. The laws were already in place in this country that made discrimination based on race in any state, in any <coughs> locality, illegal. Those are the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And this might sound like, you know, how many, you know, like a, a, a semantic distinction, but to me it's very important because in a sense, we are trying to educate today the judges and our fellow citizens as well as the military and the police that there are already laws on the books, in effect, around the world that make the kind of activities that are happening here in Syracuse uh, illegal. In the same way that it was always illegal for the state of Alabama to set up uh, colored only uh, drinking fountains. That was against the law, but it was allowed for over a hundred years. Okay, and there are more parallels here. Both of these, these, these huge, that was a huge thing with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were, were huge in the sense they counteracted the Constitution. The Constitution said an African-American is three-fifths a person. And then that was completely negated by these amendments, saying that, no, actually all, again, limited to males. I'm not trying to make this, you know, in other words, it was a, it was a step, um, are equal human beings uh, in the United States. And so, in a sense, we're in that same situation today of recognizing <coughs> that these laws are already in place. And that's an important distinction. We're not trying to change the laws. Just as, in fact, Martin Luther King and, and the civil rights people were not trying to change the laws. They were trying to uphold the laws that existed. And so the importance there is that those laws, the, the, the amendments after the Civil War, were completely buried by the Supreme Court. They were buried. You know, a lot of people know the history, how they twisted that into making corporate corporations people, those laws. Um, but. Uh, they were buried in our national consciousness. And today, the United Nations Charter is buried in our national consciousness. And, and that's what we're trying to bring up, is that this actually is the law of the land in DeWitt, New York. It takes precedent over any trespassing laws, over any um, assembly laws that the town might pass. This is the, it's real. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. This is the reality, just as the laws against discrimination were actually written out in our Constitution, passed, duly signed, uh, and it may apply in, say, Selma or any place you want to pick, including the North. So maybe that's enough for us. Mm -hmm.